All right, welcome to the Drew Pearson Show. We're coming to you tonight from Frisco, Texas, right here off the Dallas Parkway and Lebanon Road, and right next door to Smash Burgers, where we're all feeling full after eating a few of those Smash Burgers. With me are my co-host for the Drew Pearson Show, Miss Kelly, Kelly Webster, Paul Salfin, and the big guy right here, standing right next to me, protecting me and watching my back, you know him as Mark Colombo, former Dallas Cowboy. And yes, that's pretty much the Drew Pearson team. And give a hand to the Drew Pearson Show Band, led by D. Paul, Darren Wise, and his crew. Thank you guys for being here. And uh, tonight is a West Texas Relief concert and show and fundraiser in connection with the Drew Pearson Show. We all have our heartfelt uh, opinions on what happened in West Texas, and we're all trying to do what we can to help those folks down there and to uh, kick off this edition of the Drew Pearson Show. We have Pastor Jim Johnson from the Preston Trail Community Church and he's going to lead us in prayer this evening. Pastor Johnson. Yeah. Thank you, Drew. Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, so much of the life that you have given us is full of blessing and opportunity. And every now and then something happens that reminds us of how frail life is and that we do indeed live in a broken and fallen world. And last week, some very important and precious people to the south of us lost their lives and they lost their homes and many of them lost their livelihood. And so this evening, they are still grieving. And we want to lift them up to you as many are around our state and around this country. And we want to join with them in asking your blessings to be upon them. Father, it's a, it's a real privilege for us tonight to be able to be the answer to some people's prayers. People have been praying for them, hoping and, and seeking to find ways to help. And tonight, we have the opportunity to put some feet to those prayers. And through our support, through our gifts, through our praying for them as well, we have an opportunity to make a difference. And so, Father, I pray indeed that you would bless this effort tonight. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Drew Pearson Show, West Texas uh, Relief Edition part of our show is now officially blessed. Thank you, Pastor. All right. More after this. Give it up for the Drew Pearson Show Band. Darren Wise, better known as D. Paul, kicking in with the lead guitar. And uh, hey, great stuff, Darren. D. Paul, Darren, nice. Yes, sir. And uh, introduce the band to us. Who you got with you? Adam on saxophone. I have Jeff on keyboard. Woo! I have Mike on the drums. And the best bass player in Dallas right here, Jesse Hall. Jesse Hall. And there, that's the lineup for the Drew Pearson Show Band. Give him a hand. All right. Let's keep moving with the Drew Pearson Show and uh, playing off the segue of uh, that great lead-in with the Drew Pearson theme song. Brings us to a musician himself, a singer, and been around forever. You guys know him from the Gatlin Brothers. With us tonight is Rudy Gatlin oh. from the Gatlin Brothers. Thank you. Woo! Thank you very much. Wow, we're big time now. We got Rudy Gatlin in the house. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us. It's great to be here. Thank you. I'm not a musician. Those are musicians. Right on. I just masquerade as a musician. Those guys can play. I hear you. you I've never heard Rocky Top any better. How about you? <laughs> oh, Rocky You think Top. we can uh, get you to put some words to that song? Sure. So that theme, I, huh? Yeah, we'll yeah, get together and get on you that. Uh, Gatlin Brothers maybe to we sing can, it for us. We can mess up that really great riff y'all got going and put some silly <laughs> lyrics to it. Sure. <laughs> right on. Drew right on. Pearson. Great guys. Great job, guys. Hey, Rudy, thanks for being with us, man. Be and uh, 
What's been going on with uh, Rudy Gatlin? Well, we kind of take it easy from uh, January to August, and then we work our tails off from September to December, kind of like the Cowboys. <laughs> right. We well, need them to work a little bit more into the into January. That's, but, that's uh, for sure. Uh, we're, we're, you know, the tour. So, so you do a lot of touring and stuff around start, the country, around the world? All, our motto is you pay, we play. Oh, I hear From you. sea to shining sea. We've been all over the known world and parts of Wisconsin. Wow. <laughs> Anybody here from Wisconsin? Yes. Good. Wisconsin We got sucks. a center, always Travis, always will. Travis Frederick from Wisconsin. Oh, no. <laughs> the Go University Packers. of Wisconsin. Go Packers. But uh, you guys grew up in an athletic family. You guys played ball, and we all know you as singers and, and uh, entertainers, but you were athletic as well. Right? We played we played football, basketball, ran track, and played baseball. Now, where did you play in football? Well, I played quarterback. Quarterback? And quarterback and oh, defensive wow. safety. Okay. And got the crud beat out of me. Yeah, and what about Larry? What did he play? He's quarterback. He was quarterback, yeah. too? So, y'all... Yeah. Dominating the yeah, quarterback position yeah. for years I could at Odessa Perryman. Yeah. Well, Odessa High School. Oh, Odessa High. Well, y'all didn't win much then because Perryman was d dominating. Well, huh? you've done going to hurt my really? feelings. Midland Lee and all that was going on? Right. But now I think it's changed, right? Is Odessa High now the Odessa's team? Odessa's playing a little better. Abilene yeah. High played, won the well, state Abilene. championship a couple of years ago. Right. Perryman's kind of fallen on hard times, but there's still mm -hmm. a lot of great coaches, a lot of great athletes, and and a great uh, football area in West Texas. Yeah. Speaking of football, you know, you, I know you're a big Cowboy fan. You've Absolutely. done some things with the Cowboys, charitable efforts. You sung at the stadium, Texas Stadium. Have you a chance to perform at the new stadium? Yes, we You did. have, huh? Well, the brothers haven't, but we, well, we just did the national anthem yeah. a couple of times. And we lost the game that we did the national anthem at, so they may not ask nah, us back. You're done. We're done. No, These no, guys. no. You guys do a great job. And we appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us this uh, evening, part of the Drew Pearson Show right here Thank in Frisco, you, Texas. Appreciate it. All right. Rudy Gatlin yes, from the Gatlin Thank Brothers. Let's appreciate give him a hand. It. Thank you very much. We got more of the Drew Pearson Show. We continue right after this. Cranking it in, D. Paul. All right, welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. D. Paul and the Drew Pearson Show band sounding good tonight. We're coming to you from Frisco, Texas, and this is the West Texas Relief Show and also a slash draft day show. And we're going to do a little draft talk now. I got my co-host, Mark Colombo, former Dallas Cowboy, my entertainment guru, Paul Southman, and Miss Kelly, Kelly Webster from... ESPN 103.3, right here in Dallas. You've heard her, now you get to see her. Hey, she looks a lot better than doing radio, geez. You got guys like Galloway, and they need to be doing radio. It's not hard to but look good you need to be on this ball. side of the camera here. <laughs> All right, right on, right on. All right, the Cowboys are first pick in the draft. They had the 18th pick. They traded down. They traded that pick to San Francisco, of all people. <laughs> Duh, they just won, came from a Super Bowl. They didn't win it, but they got a pretty good team. So what San Francisco did with that 18th pick, they ended up drafting a safety, right, which the Cowboys probably could have drafted or should have drafted. Cowboys dropped to 31st, and they pick up an offensive lineman. Tell us about their choice. Uh, offensive lineman Travis Frederick from the University of Wisconsin, Mark. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think he's a good player. Yeah. Um, I think he was the best available lineman at the time. Um, he's, I mean, he's a center, and usually centers don't go that high. Right. But I believe he's, you know, he's really smart. He graduated in three years. He's, you know, he's a, a, an engineer. Uh, he's the type of guy that can line up an offensive line and make all the calls and make it really easy for Tony Romo. So, you know, I still would have liked to see what they would have done at 18. But I do like the fact that they're going offensive line. I think that's really, really important right now for the Dallas Cowboys. And it, it really does start at center. Well, they got a little stockpile there at center, right, with uh, Cook and then Costa. Yeah, and even it, Kowalski can play center as well. It'll be a battle, and I think a lot of, you know, there's going to be a battle for the guard positions too. Right. You know, it's going to create a lot of competition, which, which I think is real good for the Cowboys. So, you know, I... I think he's a good player. You know, Wisconsin, like you said, it breeds good offensive linemen, a lot like BC. You know, they do well in, the, in professional football. So, mm -hmm. Well, they took a whole day for the first round of the draft, and uh, 
second rounds today, second and third rounds, and understand, Miss Kelly, that the Cowboys did make a pick already in the second round. They did. They've got one pick in the second round. They've already grabbed him. It's Gavin Escobar, a tight end out of San Diego State. He's six foot five, so good size. Mm. Apparently, he runs good routes. He's able to get good separation. Unfortunately, the knock on him is he's not a very good run blocker, mm. which does not bode well for an offense that needs a run game and a successful one at that. So I think the Cowboys are fast becoming a team that makes decisions and make, makes moves. And what it does is it creates giggles and snickers because no one really knows what they're doing. Right. The moves don't make a ton of sense. Uh, if they would have drafted based on the best player available with that 18th pick, mm -hmm. it was not going to be a center out of Wisconsin. And it just seems like they always try and get cute instead of what's doing best for the team. And I think fans are really just sort of fed up with it. And in fact, today on ESPN Radio, yes. there was a ton of just apathy yes. because fans are so used to this nonsense and wondering, how is this going to help our team? We are 8-8. Eight and eight. I want to get past 8-8. Eight and eight. Yeah. I'd actually like to sniff the playoffs. And not to sniff it, but do well. Yeah, Call we me crazy. We actually thought that the Cowboys had gotten it. You know, Last year, they traded up to get Morris Claiborne, good move, right? Sure. That's the kind of moves you want because that's a player that, what, he came in and he helped them immediately, and that's what they need. I don't know if this guy, Travis Frederick, can come in and help these Cowboys immediately. But when they made that move, we said, oh, now they finally got it. But now we see what happens with this draft th thus far, and then we say, maybe not. And Mark touched on it. It is a need. They do need a solid center. Right, it would right, be great right. if this guy is an eight to 10 year guy. I don't even care if he makes the Pro Bowl. We just want a solid center who is not injury prone, who is gonna be there game after game, provide some consistency for everybody on the line and Tony Romo. Yeah, I think- But he wasn't the yeah. best available player at that spot. And by most accounts, a third rounder. Yeah. Average third rounder, this guy was left They've got two picks in the third round. Yeah, I, I think that he was the highest pick on the Cowboys list. I, I don't think, like I said, I don't think he's a bad pick. I think what the Cowboys were really trying to do, they, I, I thought they would have tried to trade up for a Jonathan Cooper or uh, a Warmack. But I, to, for two guards to go in the top ten picks, it, it's outrageous. I mean, right. guards are late to late first round picks, early second round picks, really good guards. It's just, it's the year of the offensive linemen. And I think they were unfortunate because they could have got one of those two guys in a normal draft class where you have skill positions like quarterbacks and running backs and receivers that take away a lot of the top 10 picks. So, I mean, I, I think it was almost too far of a stretch for them to trade up to get those two guys because I don't think mm -hmm. they're a seven and a 10 pick. They're somewhere in the middle of the first round where the Cowboys were. Right, well, there's nine offensive linemen drafted in the first round. That's that is the <laughs> most since 1968 in the NFL when Ron Yeri was the number one pick and played a number of years, 10 plus years or so, Hall of Famer for the Minnesota Vikings. But you see the emphasis now on the offensive line. You see what San Francisco did in building their offensive line and what a difference that made with their football team. You saw the Baltimore Ravens build their offensive line and all of a sudden, Joe Flacco now is a great quarterback and end up getting all that money. So that seems to be where the emphasis is now in the offensive line and even with defensive linemen as well. They become the commodities and what teams are looking for now in the NFL. But, hey, with Drew Pearson Show, we know how to pick them. That's why we got a great team right here and our great band as well. And we'll have more of the Drew Pearson Show, hey, right after this. Crank it up, Deep Paul. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. I'm here with Red and Black, and we're talking about the NFL draft. Now, what can these players do financially to secure a better future for them when they get in the NFL? Well, given some of the numbers I've heard thrown around, the first thing I think of is, like, save some of that money versus spending it all. 
I, I, th I think it's crazy right now, all the stories we hear about NFL players going bankrupt. I mean, after even a short period of time leaving the NFL. So, I mean, what kind of steps are these players doing that are wrong? Well, I'm not so sure that it's necessarily what they're doing that's, that's wrong. It's, they have never been taught what's right. I mean, that's the problem we're seeing in the schools, and we're seeing it all throughout societies. Nobody understands the basics. And so the problem then is when you have more money, your mistakes are bigger. I want to talk about your book, now that you just mentioned it. Did Check we? it out. <laughs> sort of. You say, kind of your, it's kind of about your life. So tell us a little bit about the book, and I, I want to know some of, the, some of the stories, you know, when you guys went around to schools. I'm going to start it, and then I'm going to let my sister Black take over. Um, I provided the crisis. My husband got fired. And like I said, I had great college education, but I was clueless. And my sister, on the other hand, she's an MBA, so I thought she had all wow. those answers. So my husband gets fired. I send her an email, and I'm like, just tell me what to do. I was a straight-A student. I'll do it really well. Um, she just didn't want to tell me what to do. She actually wanted me to start um, thinking about things. I mean, God, what's up with that? Well, she has two children. I have two race cars. So our priorities on a day-to-day -day basis are very different. I couldn't tell her what to do with her money any more than I could tell you what to do with yours. But what I got her to do is to stop and think about what her priorities were and what was really important and why she wanted to do these things and why she wanted to spend money on any given item. And once you start thinking about the why, it helps you put things in perspective of what you're going to spend. But when I, I think about some of the, these, these football players and these huge numbers, and, and this is a question I'm going to ask you, does anyone ever when you're out in a game, do they say, okay, we want to do this a yard at a time? Or are you looking for the big play? No, and we're all looking for the big play. We want to make the home run, the Hail, the Hail Mary right here, <laughs> the Hail Mary moment. You know, that, that, that's, what, that's what we look for, the big play. But when you start looking at financial decisions, you're doing it a yard at a time because there's a lot of risk in going for that, that big play. Great point. That's financial advisors. Um, you know, there are a lot of really solid financial advisors. But I do believe a player relies a little bit too much on them, you know, to, to pay their bills, you know, literally to write checks for them. So it takes, you know, all thinking out of the athlete's equation, but the athlete doesn't really know what the financial advisor is doing with his money. And then to couple that with they really not getting any real life education on how to do it. So once they leave the game, they don't they don't know what they're doing. And it's just it's really sad from um, what what I've read. I've been told that they they have some rookie finance classes i guess it's rookie week <laughs> yeah <laughs> they, they okay no, yeah. so okay so the rookie symposium every year that you, you go to the rookie symposium as a rookie okay you get your little shirt it says you know 2013 rookie. I am a rookie okay <laughs> so they have financial advisors that come in and talk to these kids but i really think they would benefit from my two lovely ladies up here <laughs> Because I've seen some of your presentations, and we talked about uh, it, we talked about being money moments. I think that's preliminary. Yeah, that's going to be the name of it. And I think you guys should be going to these rookie symposiums. I think you should be going around to these colleges and meeting with these kids, and letting them know that you know it's not boring. I've seen your I've seen your uh, your YouTube videos. They're excellent. Look up Red and Black. But I think it's going to be something that it's going to take people by surprise. And you're going to get people interested in learning how to handle their money. Well, thanks. I mean, we, we just see the difference it's making even with students. And, well, you know what it's like. I mean, you, you, you have young kids, but we go with students. And if you can't make it fun and entertaining and relevant, then they're not interested. And if nothing else, because this book was never supposed to be like financial literacy. It was a basis of a sitcom. So I think if nothing else, we just like to make sure that whoever we're talking with has a good time. Um, but they always seem to come away with something which is really practical and relevant. And um, so we'd love to do stuff like that. That'd be great. Okay. I want to thank you guys for coming on the show. We're going to be doing a lot more. And Thanks I can't, can't wait to see what happens. <laughs> so that's it for this segment. Uh, coming back with the Drew Pearson Show. Welcome to Coda Sushi Lounge. We're here at Coda Sushi Lounge in Frisco. Man, this place is incredible. And today, I'm learning how to make sushi. So, Ken. Let's roll. Let's rock and roll. So, Kenny, what roll are we making today? We're going to make the ranger roll today. Ranger roll. So, yes. what's in a ranger roll? Ranger roll is come with the shrimp tempura with the cream cheese and jalapeno <laughs> and cucumber and top with the spicy curry and the six spice super white tuna. Oh, just and for the lime and the on the side. Yes. All right, so let's do it. Sure. 
So what are we gonna start with? You know, this is my first time making sushi, so. Alright, how are we gonna make it? I have to sushi? learn. Okay. Is it sear it? Yep. And then we wet the hand a little bit. There it is, the rice. Rice put on the seaweed paper, just like this, and then equally spread out on the seaweed paper. Yep. And then we flip it over. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna put some cream cheese. Oh, I really like cream cheese. I can see why you guys are so popular. You already got the cream cheese on there. First oh thing. yeah, we have to. We have to be fast. Uh, <laughs> now we got a little bit of spice, a little jalapeno. Yes, sir. All right. See, I like a little spice in my sushi. Sure. And some cucumber. All right. And two pieces of the shrimp tempura. Yeah, I was I was eyeing up that shrimp tempura earlier. Delicious. Yes, sir. And then how are we gonna do? All right, so it's upside down. So. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So you roll. Yep. Then we roll it up. We'll try to cover the roll equally. Okay. And then one more time. And how tight that looks. Yes. All right. And now we're gonna put some. Oh, it looks so pretty. What kind of sauce? What kind of sauce is we putting on here? The uh, sauce is gonna be some uh, sweet Thai chili sauce. Okay. Now we're oh, gonna put good. some spicy creme. Yeah. Okay. I just want to eat it whole, like a hot oh, yeah. dog. Sure, you can. Put it in a little bun and eat it. Sure. And this is some six spice super white tuna. Look at. What kind of spices do they rub that with? There's some um, basically it's based on some seven spice, uh, chili pepper, yep. Japanese spice, and some paprika, and then some Cajun flavor. Now is this one of your more popular rolls here, the Ranger? Yeah, yes sir. Now, how long does it usually take you to make to make rolls? To make a roll? A few years. It depends how fast you learn. Uh. All right, then we cut it. In egg slices. I like the size of your rolls too. It seems like they're a lot bigger than yeah, most definitely. of them. Yeah. I don't like when you get little small chintzy rolls. I don't like that at all. They're too small. You can't taste anything, right? Yeah, nothing. That looks like it has a lot of flavor. Look at how good that looks. Right. And the rangers come with some crawfish as well. Alright, that's how we put on Look at that. for the ranger. Though. Look at this, unbelievable. I've never seen so much work go into Exactly. I like how the wasabi is underneath the little wine. Yeah, it's a, uh, the little it. martini glass. Yeah, very cool. And then now we're going to put the sauces. For the crawfish, we're going to put some what is that? like based on the spicy mayo. Yep. And then for the roll, we're gonna put some sweet Thai chili sauce. So you gotta have a little bit of healthy on the plate right there. Definitely. You know what I mean? Make you feel good about eating that. We try to make it healthy. <laughs> and some. Look at that. Now that's what I call a roll. Yep, there you go. This is a ranger roll. Oh, all right everyone, we'll see you at home. Ranger Roll, come to Kota Sushi. This place is incredible. Thank you, Kenny. You are. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right. That's it for the Drew Pearson Show. Here you go, ladies. And this is the Ranger Roll. Extra spicy. Oh my God, that looks so good. All right. That looks good. All right, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Show. Good job, Darren. All right, I'm here with Sarah Kaiser. Now, she works over in Frisco at the Big Game, and they were gracious enough to make these footballs for us. So, you know, what goes into making one of these? Well, what you're holding in your hand is a leather football, so made from the same leather that we make a lot of the game balls with. Um, and then we have some custom information talking about the relief effort in West that uh, we're, we're really excited to be a part of this event. 
and the donations that y'all are doing for the West Texas victims and all that kind of stuff. We're just excited to be a part. So um, we're, we're local here in Frisco. So when we heard y'all were going to be here. We wanted to be a part too. So give it up for Frisco, yeah, the applause. hometown. Yeah, round of applause. Yeah. So it's just... It's American footballs. It is fun to know that America's favorite sport, football, is also made here in America, and we're just excited to do that. And thanks for making these footballs, and we'll be right back on the Drew Pierce. Show. What do you got for me tonight, Mike? Uh, Drew, uh, naturally, there's a lot of questions about the draft, so we'll, we'll take a few of those real quick here. Uh, Jay on Facebook says picking Travis Frederick with the number one 31 pick was not the problem. The problem was the move 13 spots down for a third, uh, late third rounder. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I don't know why they would move down. They could get a good quality player at 18. And uh, what they should have done in that position, uh, uh, except the best player on the board. And instead, they tried to be smart and cute and trade down. They got the 31st pick, and everybody's like saying, why they have to do that to get him? Because Travis Frederick probably would have been there with their first pick in the second round. But that's what they decided to do, and we got to live with those things because we can't change them. Uh, and now there's a lot of buzz, too, with the, with the second pick uh, coming from Daniel Badajosa and Fred Budos. Uh, they're basically asking, what do you think of the first two picks, specifically in the second pick as a guy who only started 11 games the past two years at tight end? Yeah, you got a tight end there. And I guess what the Cowboys are thinking with those first two picks is trying to uh, add more bodies, more talent to the offensive side of the football. And, you know, with the problems we had with the offensive line last year, that's probably why they went in that direction in the first round. And then, you know, uh, with uh, – tight ends emerging now teams need two tight ends and the Cowboys figure that and the one they got in the draft there six five guy was Miss Kelly what's his name Gavin Escobar. Gavin Escobar you know I've never heard of him but hopefully he's a player and can step in and help the Cowboys immediately uh, just a reminder tweet your questions in to the at Drew Pearson show on Twitter or the Drew Pearson show on Facebook and we'll be glad to have them here on the air all right, that's Michael Nass, social media director for The Drew Pearson Show. We'll be right back with more after this. All right, our special West Texas Relief Show continues with our weekend segment, The Weekender. And the guy that usually handles that for us, the entertainment guru for the Drew Pearson Show, my co-host, Paul Salfin. And, Paul, you got to witness and watch another great movie. Tell us about it. Yeah, actually, I love my job. I get to watch all these great movies and talk to the, the wonderful, talented people behind them. And this week was no exception. There's a new film called The Place Beyond the Pines, and it's starring two of the hottest actors right now, Ryan Gosling and Bradley Cooper. Mm. And it's a very, very good movie. It's very sad, but I think people are really going to love it. It kind of takes place over a series of years and goes over the theme of the sins of the father affecting the son. Oh, okay. And uh, it's very deep, it's very intense, and it's from director Derek Cianfranz, who directed Ryan Gosling in Blue Valentine. And so Derek came to Dallas, and so I got to talk to him about the film, and it's quite impressive. So uh, let's take a look at that, shall we? All right, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Luke and the Heartthrob. Is Romina here? Who's that guy? He's yours. It's such a powerful film, and, and I believe that it's a, sort of one of the big things is, is about the sins of the father affecting the son. And as a father, did you think about that a lot? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, you know, the reason I started writing this film back in 2007 was kind of based around all of my fears and vulnerabilities about becoming a father again. You know, my wife was pregnant with our second son, and I was thinking about legacy. I was thinking about everything I was going to pass on to him. And I was thinking about everything that was passed on to me, and I was just wanting him to be born into the world without my sin, without my wrongdoing, without uh, you know any uh, you know any of my 
I didn't want to soil him, you know. And there's a great moment in the movie where Ryan picks up this baby for the first time and he's covered in tattoos and he doesn't feel worthy, you know, to hold the baby. And that's that's a moment that I was really, uh, you know, that was that felt really close to me, you know, as a father and as a filmmaker. I wanted to make a film that was about uh, about that passing on, you know, what you know about being a father. I was also, th you know, reading a lot of Jack London books when I first started writing this movie, and I was thinking a lot about ancestry, you know, and I started thinking about my, uh, you know, the ancestors and kind of the brutality in which they've had, they had to live their lives, you know, in order to survive, I mean, true brutality. And here I am, a domesticated man, eating with a knife and a fork and saying, please and thank you. Uh, but I still feel that animal inside of me, you know what I mean? And that's what this movie was about. It was about that animal, you know? Do you feel like this helped keep that in check? Like, do you feel satisfied now, or do you still worry about that? Look, I always, uh, I made Blue Valentine as a response to my parents' divorce and as a way for me as a young man to have uh, a relationship or a marriage that uh, would try to stand the test of time. Um, kind of a cautionary tale for myself. It doesn't mean that, like, uh, it's easy now, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I work hard with my wife every day. I fight with my wife every day and I fight with her because it's worth it. Do you know what I mean? Because we're fighting for it together. Um, and so, you know, as a father, you know, I'm not going to say like the crystal, you know, like I, I, I had the, the magic dust that made me, you know, a perfect father or whatever, but I'm, but I make these films because I, I try to make as personal and as vulnerable of movies as a filmmaker uh, to just, you know, to also speak with the audience too. Well, the show that that we're uh, on here is the Drew Pearson show, mm -hmm. and uh, Drew is one of our former Dallas Cowboys and caught the famous Hail Mary catch. Oh, yeah. And uh, and the thing about that is we started asking people what their Hail Mary moments were, where it just didn't look like a good idea, and you just had to go for it, whether you're catching or passing, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel like there's a good Hail Mary moment in your life where you just had to go for it and it worked out for you? I mean, my my whole life has been that, you know. I mean, trying to you know, make films. This is my this is my dream since I was six years old, you know. And although it doesn't really feel like, it doesn't feel like a, a particular, um, like, incredibly, you know, uh, impossible chance either. I always felt like that this is what I was born to do. The cast in this is fantastic, and uh, particularly start out with Ryan Gosling. And, and he actually agreed to do this film uh, before Blue Valentine? Uh, you know, I was I started writing it in 2007. That's two years before I shot Blue. And I remember I was at Ryan's agent's house one night and we were having dinner and you know, I started asking Ryan, I said, man, you've done so much in your life. What haven't you done? And he said, well, uh, you know, what I said, what haven't you done that you've always wanted to do? He said, well, I always wanted to rob a bank, but I'm too scared of jail. And I said, oh, that's, that's funny. I'm writing a movie about a bank robber. I said, how would you do it? And he said, well, I would do it on a motorcycle because I could go in uh, and have a helmet on and no one would know who I was. It would disguise my identity. And then motorcycles are fast, so I could, you know, ride away and, you know, they're very agile. I could get out at tight spaces. And he said, then I would have a U-Haul truck parked about four blocks away and I'd drive the motorcycle back into the back of the truck and then drive away in the truck because the cops would be looking for a motorcycle, not a truck. And I said, that's crazy. That's exactly what we've written into the screenplay. That's exactly the way the guy does it in the, in the movie. And he said, no way. And it was one of those times that I realized that we were destined to make movies together, you know? And so I told him I'd make, him, I'd, uh, make his dreams come true. And he's quite the pop culture, I guess, what you call it, a phenomenon or enigma. But what is it about him, because you've worked closely with him, that you think everyone just seems to resonate with? Ryan is a magic person. He's a magic human being. He makes the world a better place. He can do things uh, because he believes, you know? Uh, he's, I mean, there's so many things that make Ryan, you know, special. I'll give you an example on this movie. He, there was a lot of stunts that he had to do in this movie um, because the way I wanted to shoot the film, I wanted to shoot it in a lot of long takes, especially the stunt sequences. If anything, the Blue Valentine was noted for, it was for its frank take on sexuality. For this, I wanted the movie to still be authentic and honest. And there was, you know, motorcycle chase scenes in this movie. So I had to shoot them in a way that was real, which meant that we had to really do them. My, my, uh, my reference point for the chase scenes in this movie, it, it was not other movies. It was, 
uh, America's wildest police chases and cops, you know, and the only way to do that is to go fast. And that means that a lot of the time I needed Ryan to be on that motorcycle. So there was one take in particular where he, where he had to rob a bank, get out, get on his motorcycle, try to start it up. It doesn't go. He has to go out into traffic, be pursued by a police officer and blow through an intersection and miss 36 cars. Um, and he had to do that. I couldn't put a stunt guy on that. Um, and uh, so about eight weeks before production, I had Ryan training with our stunt coordinator, uh, Rick Miller, who was, you know, anytime Batman gets on a motorcycle, that's Rick Miller. Um, so Rick uh, gave him his first lesson, and after, afterwards I said, okay, Rick, on a scale of one to 10, where would you rank Ryan? And he said, about a three. Hmm. I said, uh-oh, that's no good. I said, well, you got eight weeks with him, so after eight weeks, where do you think he can get to? He said, maybe a three and a half, a four if he's lucky. He says, look, this takes a long time. This is a lifetime to do this. And I said, okay, well, all you can do is just keep practicing with him. Flash, you know, flash forward eight weeks later, day before production, Ryan wraps up his final, his final stunt lesson. I asked Rick, where did he get to? Scale of one to 10. Rick said he got to a seven. So that shows you that Ryan can do things that normal people cannot do. You know, for instance, he doesn't know how to ride a skateboard, but I could give him a skateboard and he could do something with it. Um, so, yeah, I'm indebted to him. You know something, Luke? If you ride like lightning, you're gonna crash like thunder. Welcome. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Drew Pearson Show, a special West Texas Relief Show tonight and draft show. I want to thank all my special guests, Rudy Gatlin. Woo! Yeah. All right, the Texas Legend Dancers, red and black, and my co-host, Miss Kelly, Kelly Webster, Paul Southen, and the big guy behind me, Mark Colombo. We want to thank all our sponsors, Best Buy, Smashburger, Dodge City of McKinney, and all the support that we have. We appreciate it. And uh, that's a wrap. D-Paw, take us out. <laughs>